Welcome back to the Profit Playbook Podcast, Episode 6. And we have a special guest with us today, uh, n- none other than Josh Galt, good friend, and uh, used to be uh, part of the uh, uh, eBay Power Hour Podcast. And he is taking time out of his day to come and hang out with us today in the uh, Profit Playbook Podcast. So welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Appreciate you. Of course. Uh, we've been trying to get you on, and uh, I know that you have a, had a sort of a transition uh, coming back from a full-time job back to full-time doing uh, eBay. And so we thought uh, since you uh, decided to go and do your, your channel again, it would be a good time to get you on and kind of pick your brain uh, about the current state of uh, reselling. So, yeah. uh, so uh now, is this a? Are you are you back? Or is this something that uh, uh, was just a temporary kind of thing where you're, you know, had to take a pause from reselling? Uh, reselling, I'm back. I mean, I never, um, I never let off the gas on my business, um, but I had to make some changes um, because of some personal things that were weighing me down, and. I, kind of made a pro and con list of what I needed to do and what the best path forward. Uh, What I will say is if you are a sole proprietorship in Canada and I'm a Canadian citizen, my business is a Canadian business. It is virtually impossible as a sole proprietor to get uh, a loan or a lease for a vehicle, which I needed or a mortgage or anything. If you're self-employed, unless you have either a letter of employment or you have some sort of history of a corporation paying you. Um, I, as far as I understand down here, it's a, it's a lot different. So between me needing to get a letter of employment and then getting, needing to get onto a a dental plan, it was the best course of action, um, for me to start working. Sales were kind of slow because I had overhauled my inventory and, um, yeah, I would say it was a strategic thing, um, more or less. So, So, When I first started listening, you, you were talking about incorporating. And so is that something that you're going to push forward with now just so you don't have this problem again? I'd like, so it, it's very complicated. And that's a really good question, Beard. Um, it's it's very complicated for a few reasons. Number one, I'm operating out of the U.S. Uh, as a Canadian company. So ideally, I'd like to set up a subsidiary. So Canadian corporation then set up a subsidiary that is a U.S. corporation. That way I can operate out of the U.S., Uh, With tax laws, it becomes very difficult. But what I'm finding the most difficult is transferring the assets, which is my inventory, out of a sole proprietorship into a corporation. So the corporation would have to buy the assets from the sole proprietorship. Um, So that's that's a whole complicated process that I don't 100 percent understand and will have to be hired out. Uh, So that's on my list of things that I need to do. Um, But it's not. You know, again, the structure in the U.S. is much different than it is in Canada. You can have a C Corp, L Corp, S Corp, uh, which are kind of like hybrids of sole proprietorships and um, corporations. Uh, It's either in Canada, you're either a corporation or you're a sole proprietorship or you're a partnership, which is basically a sole proprietorship. I hope I'm not boring everyone to death with this stuff. No, that's good. But it's not it's not a it's not a simple uh, transition is what I'm trying to say. It's definitely different down here. Um, you know, I got the mortgage for this house. I refinance it as a reseller full time, uh, pay for two cars. So I, I have no issues, you know, getting loans, getting credit for the business as I'm an S Corp. But it's S, for those of you who don't know, S Corp is basically just for taxes. It's basically a fan. It's a sole proprietorship that, that has a few rules I have to follow. Yeah. And, you know, I found, too, that I've had a lot of uh, opportunities for credit and grants and um growth funds have reached out to me with my business, but they're all American. And as soon as they find out that you're a Canadian company, you're disqualified. And those things are very difficult to get access to in Canada, extremely difficult. So um, this is kind of where I'm at. It's not something I really understood or knew when I first started. And I would say uh, it's at this point in time, it's still over my head. It would be something that I need help with. Um, And it's going to take some time, but um, for now, you know, it's on my list of things to do, I guess. So listen to you yesterday. You had, you had, a, you had a show that I, I, I don't, you talk about that. You catch some grief from, from people for haters for whatever reason, but 
I find it very fascinating because some of the stuff that you're dealing with and, you know, making life changes and making the business work for your, the way you want to live, I'm fighting those same battles. Um, a lot of people call it burnout or whatever, but um, really, really challenged me again. Uh, my buddy, John, uh, not this John, but another John, John has really talked about, you know, SOPs and, and really streamlining the business. And I, and I, I was happy to see that, that I'm not the only one that's going down this road. It's yeah. Yeah. It's, it's um, really, it, it, it's, it's really, I think the hardest thing to accept in reselling and we'll just dive right into the day. Um, people want to talk about changes in platforms and everything that happens to you reselling. Nobody wants to talk about changing themselves, changing what they do, changing their business and accepting some responsibility for the situation you find yourself in. It's just, it, the boogeyman in the room is always a platform, eBay, Amazon, they're evil. Um, yeah. But well, and I think too, uh, it was nice to, and we all kind of did this, all three of us where we kind of went and deep dive with eBay and some of the other platforms and why are they doing this and why are they doing that? And, you know, they call it the fog of war. So when it's happening, you don't really see clearly what's all going on, but then you kind of zoom out as time goes on and you're, you're like, okay, they had to make some changes. Uh, they had to do reverse image search. They had to incorporate AI. They had to do this stuff with the counterfeiting because they were getting pressured from the government and a lot of special interest groups. So I understand now um, why all that had happened, but it had a very, um, it was very impactful on my business when it first started happening because I didn't understand. But then, like you said, there are a lot of things that eBay or any of the platforms, they don't have any control over, like what's going on in the macro economy, the squeeze consumer, changing trends. Um, you know, you were talking today about um, what would be three days ago for the viewers. You were talking about promoted listings, uh, it, promoted listings. And I don't want to. I don't want to talk too much about this because we've talked it to death, but promoted listings, it's a standard on every other platform. It is a standard people yes. on Amazon uh, promote people on, on uh, Shopify, especially promote it's, it's just a standard. So uh, we are in like the first inning of promoted listings. It's here to stay. I'm willing to use it, but I want to see the return. And then, and then that's on me. If I could add one more point, guys. I allowed my health to really get the better of me over three years as I really sacrificed to build my business. I think that was a mistake. This year, I've made it a priority and it gets harder as you get older to get my health back because how, your outlook on things, your outlook on your business and everything, it's affected 100% by how you feel. So if I'm not taking the time to make myself feel better, it's going to impact everything around me. So I think for a lot of us who have gone through the ringer for the past three years, please look after yourself. Um, because once your health really goes, you, you might not be able to get it back. Did you just call so, me old, by the way? <laughs> 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 and so, so I've taken this a step farther, um, trying to, to, as things change. And so the biggest change for me in my business and as what's really thrown a monkey wrench into to what I'm doing and, how I'm completely changing. I went back to sourcing RA. I went back to, I do a lot of my own ship. People don't understand the, the effect of ground advantage. Ground advantage introduced by the post office was, we don't talk about it enough. We mention that it's a win and we move on. But so here's, here's how it affected me. So anything that was over a pound, Amazon will fulfill it cheaper. You know, so you'd send that item in and let, let FBA handle it. Yep. Because you know you you once you got over a pound, you know you're stuck with UPS. UPS Ground was always expensive, and then you'd go priority, so you'd be seven, eight, nine dollars, ten dollars an item. Ground advantages have come in, including Ground Advantage Cubic, and these I, I'm shipping. I don't have items over eight dollars hardly anymore, and yeah. so it's made it where it it's significantly more profitable for me to do FBM, where I used to do FBA, because now if now now with all the new Everybody goes, oh, Amazon and their fees. They're doing fees for this, fees for that. They're leaving FBM alone. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so they're encouraging people to, especially the small seller, you know, not to clog up their warehouse with a bunch of ones and twos because those are very difficult for Amazon to, 
you know, if they've got a seller who has, you know, a thousand of an item, they can deal with that. But it's much harder to deal with a seller who's in in three, three well, years. It, it, isn't it interesting there what you just said about how Amazon is pretty much adopting an eBay model because that's what FBM is. And mm -hmm. then eBay with its uh, the way it's developing, it's trying to create its own pseudo fulfillment centers with its international sh shipping. And it's trying to kind of ad adopt the Amazon model a little bit. So I find that really interesting that they're both kind of trying to take uh, the pros from each other and adapt it to their own model. See, people don't, if you don't really take the time to, with an open mind to look at these things, people will just say, oh, eBay's never doing anything. But eBay is active. You know, we, they just don't get the credit for it. You know, Amazon makes the news. Amazon's got more sellers. It, that, everybody hears what Amazon's doing eBay just plods along that, you know, they, they're a little slower to turn that, you know, they react, but they're, they're definitely being proactive in this, but it's really changed. You know, I look back and I think I struggled last year with ending last year. And a lot of that was on me and, you know, my mindset. So, you know, I felt challenged for listening to you, Josh, and I, I appreciate you coming into this space to, to really start listening to business books has changed the way I think. Um, it sort of changed the way I look at business. It's, you know, I look at myself back now and I go, man, for the first 10 years of doing this full time, you are a high function hobbyist. You were never treated as seriously as a business. And that's hard to look at your own self and accept the fact that, um, you know, I've got a college degree in business. You know, I, I feel like I did pretty good at this. And I look at it and go, man, if I had treated this like a business, I would be way ahead and I'd have made way different decisions. But um, it's just just the way to, it's never too late, though. And. And so that's why I'm, I'm streamlining. I'm sometimes you got to yep. cut things off to get ahead, make it building easier. processes. I'm working on yeah. processes Bu and all these things that I laughed at John when he told me. <laughs> but you you can't you can't get to that place unless you're honest with yourself. Uh, you know, 100%. if you if you're thinking that everything's fine, you're never you're in your comfort zone. I think that's a big thing. People get comfortable when it comes to this business. And unless you can allow yourself to get uncomfortable, I've said it many times, uh, you can't you can't get to these places that you're talking about. Yeah. It, well, and what Beard is saying a little bit um, is the processes, building processes. So you treat it like a business, you build repeatable processes. It's super important. Uh, so when you have your processes in place, it almost at some point doesn't really matter what the items are as long as you have the knowledge uh it's like a machine in and out so i think that that was a thing that um you know it's not unique to me or to anybody here in this room like this it's just straight up business that you you create processes make them repeatable teach them to someone else and then get them to do it and you scale and, and off you go um but i think that was something that i really wanted to bring was a business mindset to eBay because tell me what you both think about this. eBay is still one of the very few places in America where they, you can build a small business. You know, it's hard to do it on main street in your town. It's very, the government is not super pro uh, small business, even though, you know, you would think they are it, but eBay is, you can start a business. You can just decide tomorrow to start a business and you can go on to eBay. It's hard to do everywhere else. So, you know, that, yeah. that is something that I think is a great benefit to everybody out there. Well, I think, eBay, I think eBay is easier to get started in. There's no barrier of entry. You just get started, right. And then hope that eBay gives you more listings to work with over time. <clears throat> but you can say the same thing for, for folks who, have no intention on selling on eBay that maybe they want to do RA and they get involved in Amazon, right? Um, yes. But I, the only thing I would say is if you want to, if, if you want to do Amazon, I would start with eBay first because they're a little bit more forgiving and I'll give this to beard, yeah. but I, they're a little bit more forgiving. So if you're going to make mistakes when you don't know what you're doing, make those mistakes on eBay. Once you jump into Amazon and you start playing with the gating and Amazon starts competing with you and you're not allowed to list that product because it's on some sort of weird list, you're done and it's over. eBay, I feel, is a little bit more forgiving, but I'm going to give it to you, Beard. What do you think about that? No, you're 100% correct. Uh, it's Am Amazon is you make a mistake. Uh, it's 
they treat it as life or death where eBay is much more of a friendly platform where, you know, you'll get the letter saying, Hey, you probably didn't know, you know, here's our rules, please review them and make sure you don't make this mistake again. It's very, very forgiving to a, a first timer. And, and so I hundred percent agree. You want to, you want to learn, you want to, cause the, I mean, let's be for real. The, 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 the mechanics are the same. It's still, you still buy, you still make money on the buy. You still, it's still buy low, sell high. It's still understand. And even now, even more than ever, eBay is, is rewarding sales and, and visibility based on these, the popularity and sell through of an item, which has been Amazon strength this whole time. And so even, so you've got a platform that reflects more of what Amazon is, but is more forgiving. So it's hundred percent true. Start on eBay first. eBay, you know, it's a little more difficult to make a listing because on Amazon, but eBay takes a little longer to make the list. You know, if, so you can pick it back on Amazon listing very easy. But to make a listing on Amazon is hard, but making a listing on eBay and, and understanding the details teaches you a lot. And, and we don't yeah, give eBay exactly. enough credit. It, it teaches you. It teaches you so much about business, about how to run a business, customer service, shipping, packing, finding items, all these things. Uh, you're, you know, you're left to the wolves on, on uh, Shopify and Amazon. But with eBay, you know, there's some forgiveness. You slowly build up. I think it's an, it, it's an incredible platform. I still love it. In spite of everything, I love it still. And I, I like that you're mentioning Shopify. Um, so I've had some ideas about that too, where you know I do a lot of yard sales and that kind of stuff. And I've really, really toyed with the idea of taking my website, which I don't promote a lot, and and saying, "Hey, I found it at a yard sale. It's available on BeardedPicker.com." And and doing some, I'm gonna I'm gonna try some of that probably in middle of the end of the year just to see what happens. See it. Cause the hardest part about Shopify is driving the traffic. And so it's going to be yeah. very interesting uh, as you, cause you were talking about yesterday on your show, which will be four days late now later, you know, about ads on Shopify and how you can, you can pin down on Facebook and send them to a direct group on. So if you had a bunch of longer burger baskets, you could send them to a pro longer burger group and say, Hey, here that all these are. And so you, you have a lot of control. That's the one thing I don't like about promoted listings Yeah, is you just, you just give an eBay money and they're just trust us. Right. <laughs> Amazon they might show, they might show you're at it four in the morning, uh, you know, yeah. in, in Alaska and you're a nice seller. Like you don't know where it's going. So I don't know if they're going to change that and they're going to give you a little bit more control. I don't know if they like having control, but I think if you had the ability to turn the knobs a little bit yourself, where it's like only show this in, I don't know, like if I sold Patriots jerseys, I only want my stuff really shown in New England, maybe. So uh, if you had the ability to do that, then I think you'd see a better return on ad spend. And then, hey, now the playing field is a little bit level. But if they're only going to show my item in Hawaii, then, you know, I don't I don't want to use that service. But even not even locations, you know, when Amazon and pay-per-click, it's you can you can you can put negative words on there so they won't you you won't be showing ads against certain keywords and you've, you've got control over you know some of the direction you don't have 100 percent control but you have you have you you feel and i think ebay misses this part with promoted listings is is without any control the the, the seller it's hard to get buy-in when you when you just you, you can't tie results to what you're doing and that that's that's tough yeah yeah, and I, I want to say that with all this stuff we're talking about, building a business, promoted ads, growing, all this stuff, um, people, a lot of people come onto eBay or Amazon because they want the American dream. I know it sounds cliche, but they want to get out of the rat race. They want to build something. They want to contribute. They want to be able to scale it. So um, it's really ebay's job to facilitate that and then all the hard work is on you so anything that they can do to allow small businesses to grow on the platform whether it be um you know giving them uh, a better ability to control their ads or getting more customers or you know partnering with people like google or maybe even amazon for used items um really i think would do wonders for the platform and i don't know what they all have in store but um 
you know, I, I just, I can't say it enough because people sometimes say I sound negative, but eBay is just such an excellent opportunity to build a business and become a contributing member who generates in society, which I think a lot of us as business owners want to do. We love it. We love yeah, we it. Talk, we talked a little bit about eBay, uh, maybe last week or the week before where John, John had a great idea. I'll get him to talk about it. I think we think eBay fails because they need to push education to new to new members. You know, if you want to be a new seller, they do a nice job with their with their education. But we we John was really pushing the point. You talk about the requirements for education, John. Yeah, the uh, the barrier of entry is there's no barrier barrier of entry to start selling on this platform, and um, I really think that that there has to be something like with whatnot to where. Uh, you got you got to come in and spend 30, 45 minutes, an hour, uh, knowing, getting to know the best practices on eBay before you're allowed to sell. Yeah. And then after a year or two, maybe do a refresher course, 15, 20, 30 minutes so that, uh, you know, there's just too many bad sellers on the platform and that hurts all of us. You yeah. know, if, if someone has a bad experience, they, my potential future customer may not come back to be my customer because of some bad experience sure. they had with the seller. So I, I do think that they've received a message. I'm not going to speak on eBay's behalf, but what I will say is I, I go onto the technical boards on eBay uh, and the seller boards, and you're seeing a lot of people saying now, I've been suspended. I've been suspended customer service metrics. I've been suspended for location policy. I've been suspended for whatever. So, and people that I've purchased off of off of eBay, because I buy a lot on eBay too, uh, that have given me a really bad experience. I talk about this one person that kept all the, all this hair kept showing up in the boxes that I was buying from them. Uh, hmm. That person has been suspended. So I think it is, you know, it's hard. I would imagine it's hard. I'm not here to beat yeah. the drum for eBay or anything, but you know, there's millions of billions what billions of items whatever it is i mean millions of sellers millions of buyers it's very hard to police all the ins and outs as everyone's trying to game the system i would imagine it's very difficult but um yes is there some reputational damage with ebay yes it, you buy from amazon you know you're going to get the thing the next day with ebay you know it's still when are they gonna when is it gonna ship when is it this when, it, when is it that i think um that's that's a tough thing to deal with but um, I think it's incumbent upon us as eBay sellers that we do a great job and we lead by example. And here we are on here telling people how to do a good job and be professional and treat it like a business. And hopefully that message is received, especially by from newer sellers. Yeah, I, th I think they can, they can, on top of the education, I think they need to raise the bar on standards. You know, we need to get past the shipping it in a beer box or a honey bun box. You know, I've made videos and jokes about it. It's, you know, Amazon does a wonderful job because they require you to ship in a new box. You know, they get that the, the customer experience is, you know, just think about, you know, people when they order stuff, they, they pick it up on the front porch or the mailbox or wherever it's delivered. And they look down and it's, it's it, if their first vision of it is crap, it's hard to turn that ship around. But if it's a nice clean box, you have not lost from the beginning. I mean, it sets you up either way. It sets you up to succeed. It also sets you up, hey, if something's wrong, it they're not nearly as mad. You can you can work through something positively right. for that customer yeah. to, to turn the experience. But if it's, you know, I ordered a tape machine. Josh, I don't know if you've heard this story. So my first tape machine I ordered was this, this big 50-pound uh, Better Package machine. And the box is just hammered on the front porch. And uh, for packing material, this guy used – a fitted bed sheet and ceiling tiles. No shit. I'm following part of my French. This is what was in this thing. Yeah. And this machine was smashed. And when I sent him the message, he he could not he fathom the fact that, well, I, I packed it with material. He could not fathom the fact that this machine got destroyed because it was of, of <laughs> I mean, can, can you imagine it, it's a $500 machine that you're fishing out ceiling tile that's shredded up inside this thing. It was awful. Well, yeah. I mean, and and yeah. so here you go. And, and we're still talking about, uh, about that, right? Because we remember that and it was a bad experience and it goes to what you're saying about how your reputation can be so quickly damaged because 
uh, that's the bad experience, but you probably had a hundred or 150, 200, a thousand really good experiences, but it's those really bad ones where you're like, what the heck were you thinking shipping this with ceiling tiles? Like what's the matter with you? And you hear that. I heard people reaching out to me saying things were shipped in diapers. And when I said, you can't do that, they were upset because they can get them for the goodwill from the goodwill for 50 cents or whatever. Well, that's not why the diapers are donated to Goodwill so that you can wrap things up and then ship them to customers, right? That's a bad experience. Um, they said, eBay said, Adam Ireland said the first item that was submitted to the watch auth authentication service was a Rolex wrapped in a diaper. Yeah. They don't like that. That's bad customer experience. So I, I'm with you. The only caveat I would say is with the education is, you know, when you're 16 years old and you get your driver's license, you have to go through all the courses and everything else. But once you get your driver's license, what's the first thing that you do? You go down to the parking lot at the park and you start doing donuts. So even though, you know, you they get the education, people are still always going to try and bend the rules. And uh, I think with eBay, they got to balance it. And it's hard to do being too heavy handed where it pisses people off. And not being heavy handed enough where the customers are like, I don't want my Lululemons shipped in dog food bags. It's, it's a hard balance to find, I would imagine. Yeah. So uh, someone who was uh, one, one of my friends who's an Amazon seller who sold on, he sold on eBay as long as I have, you know, my account's like 23 years old. His is probably at least that old. Sends me a picture uh, a couple of weeks ago. His wife ordered something and the inside bag was a nine lives bag. Yeah. Nine lives. You know, and, and a lot of people would say, well, what do you, why do you care how I ship my items? You know, and, and if we were all dealing with customers, our own customers, right, I wouldn't care. But again, I, I can't hammer this point enough that, you know, th these are our customers and we should all be, be concerned if a buyer has a bad experience yeah. on any platform we sell on because it, it hurts the overall expectation the next time around. That's why we get a lot of buyers who just come at us with just nastiness sometimes. In, in sure. And I mean, and to your point, John, if I can add a little bit more color to it, if you are going to do this every single day, why don't you hold yourself to a high standard and do it at a high standard? Right. I mean, you're going through the motions anyway. I had um, a uranium uh, glass or Vaseline glass, um, champagne glass, beautiful glass. And the person just put it in a box and it broke into a million pieces. And when I told them, they refunded and said, what's the problem? I refunded you. Who cares? I mean, why not? If you're going to do this anyway, hold yourself to a high standard. Um, right. Be proud of yourself and your business. I mean, you. this is your mark, right? Build relationships with your customers. If you're going to do it anyway, why not do it at a high standard? That I don't understand. Why put the bare minimum in? So I don't think people understand the psychology of Josh. You know, because you know, I ran fa faster restaurants for 25 years, and one of the one of the things that was drilled into us was, is if a customer has a bad experience, they tell on average nine people. Um, if a customer has a good experience, it's less than one. Yep. And so, and you know, that's the negative effect of of a bad experience is that customer is going to tell everybody they know. Can you believe I bought this from eBay? Can you believe what they're not going to? You know, maybe some if they had a great experience and somebody says, hey, where'd you get that? They go, no, I ordered on eBay. But they're, but if they're going to go out of their way to tell you if it's terrible. And yeah, exactly. And not only are you damaging that customer, but, you know, you're damaging uh, up to nine people most of the time that they know that could have potentially bought on eBay. And yeah. so the, the negative experience hurts way worse. And, and until people understand... I, I, I think that may be part of the education is, is letting people, so I don't know that everybody understands that the psychology, you know, a lot of the stuff, you know, why does it, why does Amazon extend the handling the, the return period in, in, in for Christmas? Is it because they're being nice and they want you to have gifts and all that stuff? No, they understand that the longer the return period, the less likely you are to return it. It's, well, yeah. It's and, <laughs> and, and, and I'm sure we had a lot of new sellers come in during the pandemic um, and you know, that create, you know, that created a whole bunch of people that were at home that maybe shouldn't have been in this business, but were anyway. Um, but the people, if you rewind to a year ago, when things started changing and really getting slow for a lot of people, 
the people who were saying, what is the big deal if I take a picture on my dirty carpet and you can see my toenails, they're so long, it looks like I should be catching fish out of the Columbia River with them. Uh, and they're saying, Why, what's the big deal? Who cares? It's the same item. Those are the very first people to say, why are my sales slow? It's not fair. So like to bring it full circle to where we were before, it, it is uh, a lot of it is on us too. Um, how we present ourselves, how we build our business. And then we are reliant on the platform to funnel customers towards us. That's and right. then we close. That's right. And, you know, there's a lot of people out there. Why do you keep talking about this? You know, you all, you guys always talk about this, you know, in some way or another that, uh, you know, we need to stop using cereal boxes and stuff like that. You got to think that if eBay continually loses millions of buyers, it's not just the platform's fault. Yes, there's a lot of problems with the platforms that we see on eBay that we see from the seller's perspective. We don't even know what the buyers are going through. But I promise you, if sellers got better at dealing with customer service and uh, thinking in terms of how would I want to receive this package when they're shipping it, and delivered a better experience, eBay wouldn't be losing as many buyers as they have. And, and on each the, and every one of us. The three of us have killed ourselves to build these businesses. And everybody watching this show right now has put in an extraordinary amount of effort, gathering information, sourcing, shipping, working, and they're all watching these videos because they want to learn more and they want to get better. And the customer is the lifeblood of all of our businesses. It is the lifeblood. Without the customer, we're, we're in trouble. So if someone wants to put in a minimal effort and there's a cigarette butt in their package and I don't care and this and that, that affects everybody watching this. And that's why we harp on the fact that you are not only a representative of your own business, but you are a representative of eBay and everyone else's business as well. And eBay gives a lot of leeway where Amazon doesn't. So that that's kind of why we I think we bring it up all the time, because it affects us. It affects everybody on the platform. We want the customers to come here. We want them to have a good experience. We want them to come back. It's important or else we're all dead meat. Well, I, I think the reason why people use cereal boxes, I mean, to kill just to shut off that topic here, uh, as far as cereal boxes, people are tired of us talking about it. But it's the idea that people are looking uh, sellers are constantly looking for ways to create shortcuts. And I uh, push back and say that when it comes to customer service, when you're dealing with customers, you can't, you can't look for shortcuts. Um, it's going to really create a, a bad experience. Um, you know, when you call on the phone, when you call on the phone to get some help anywhere, whether it's eBay uh, and they give you a quick answer, you know, they don't give any references and it's just not, it doesn't feel helpful. They're trying to get you off the phone. It's well, taking a shortcut. And it's the same thing that sellers do. It's let's use the cereal box instead of going down the street and get some boxes or ordering some boxes. Uh, let's not reply to customers in a timely manner. Let's uh, disregard what our customers are saying. Let's get flippant with the customers. Uh, these are things that we we collectively do that we shouldn't be doing. And it uh, it may work once in a while, but Ultimately, if you continue to take shortcuts with your customers, it's going to it's going to bite you in the butt. Well, and it's a small minded thing, because if you want to save 30 cents on a box and you use a cereal box, all it takes is the customer to receive the item. They call and they say, hey, uh, they call eBay and say, hey, listen, I like the item and everything else. But there's like Cheerios in here and, you know, they tape the cereal box together and that's nonsense. And eBay says, OK, let us look into it. And then maybe your sales slow down for two or three days while they're in your account figuring out what's going on. So yeah. maybe that cereal box costs you $100 at the end of it. And maybe it costs the platform a customer. I mean, that that's why it's, in, it's important. I understand that as businesses, we need to save wherever we can. But don't save with the customer. Figure out somewhere else, not the customer. Steve Jobs, CEO, founder of Apple. He wanted the inside of an Apple computer to look immaculate. So if you open up the old Apple computers, everything is neat and tidy. And he said, just in case the customer opens up the back of the computer, I want them to be impressed with what it looks like. That's so, the mentality, I think, as business people that we need to have. I'm going to look the other way. And provide that kind of customer service. I'm going to tell you, it's okay to take a shortcut. 
I'm on the exact opposite of these guys because the, the way I look at it is completely different. And, and what am I doing to my business? I'm trying to streamline. I'm trying to be prepared and, and products. So that as I sell them, I have boxes. I have, I have procedures in place. So I've got the right box for the right products. I use, I've spent money to upgrade to tape machines, um, la la label printers. I've got all these things that make it so much easier for me to do the job that I need to do. That's the shortcut that I take. It's not the shortcut on what kind of box it is. You can save yourself time, money, effort, everything. And, and you save way much in the long run than you do shorting out on a box. You know, it's, right. it's the way people look at it. If, if you streamline your business and run your business correctly, it's amazing how much money you can save by saving time that, that pales in comparison to you, to a, a, a one time where, where you made the customer experience so bad because you thought you were, you were saving something. But there's, there's a big difference between streamlining your business and taking a quick shortcut because you don't want to be bothered or you want to spend money in your, in your business. Uh, I think everything you described is creating new processes. So before you'd have to get the, 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 uh, the tape gun out and tape your boxes. And then to make that process faster and look more professional, you go out and invest money into a paper tape machine but you're still, you change, you basically swapped out one process for another. And that other process has made things a little bit better for you. That's, that's not quite the same as taking a shortcut because, you know, you just don't think of it in terms of what a buyer would want. Or it, it's sort of like um, taking that same paper tape machine that you just invested in. And instead of using two strips, you're just like, you know what, uh, one is enough. And while you may have invested in that new process, you've then taken a shortcut within your, your, your streamlined process. So I think whatever the process you have, whether it's using a tape gun or a paper tape machine or any other thing that you're changing or utilizing for your business, you have to focus on doing it right. And I yeah, guess that's, yeah. what I'm talking about. that's what I'm talking about with, with the whole idea of whether you're using a cereal box or a regular professional looking box. Uh, these are all things that people can choose to do um, within their business. And I think that's the problem. People are just choosing the easier way out. So it's, yeah. it's on the same lines of being comfortable in your business. You don't want to take the effort. And, and what Beard is talking about, I agree, the efficiencies, building efficiencies within your business. Uh, yeah. Maybe the paper tape machine is faster and you can save a little bit more time. And then you can decide whether or not you want to list more or maybe, I don't know, go for a walk or whatever the case may be. Um, but I find too that it took me a while to do this. I can tell everyone here that I was one of the most inefficient listers when I first started. I would list a remote control, magnifying glass, a lock, a computer screen. I would do it all on the same day. It would take me absolutely forever. And I felt sick and burned out by the end of the day. But mm -hmm. once you build processes, like today I'm only listing cassette tapes and you get 50 ready, you can blow through them in an hour with pictures and everything. And now you can start working on other things that need to be done. And for me, I never understood this. And I heard other people say this, but they said, as your business grows, the operations side of it becomes easier. What do you mean it becomes easier? How, when it gets bigger, it's because you learn as you grow to build these efficiencies and processes that Beard's talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, your business just starts running. And once those processes are in place, you can bring new people in and teach them the processes. But if you're jumping all over the place, like I was before, um, and that went with my inventory system and the way I was listing and the way I was sourcing today, I'm going to the savers and tomorrow I'm buying a storage locker. Next day I'm trying to make some private deal. It's, it's not, it's not sustainable because there aren't, aren't the processes that Beard's talking about, which I think are really important. And Beard, you have Grumpy John on your channel. He talks about processes a lot too and, and bringing up um, efficiencies within your business, no? He does, and he has harped on me for years. And he almost had a stroke this morning when I, when I started telling him that I'm taking his advice and <laughs> that he was actually right this whole time that uh, as much as I fought it. And so... I'm taking this even to such a level that so this evening I'm going to look at all the items in my eBay store and if they don't fit in a certain size box, they are going to be delisted and sent to my local auction. 
I want the I want eBay to mirror Amazon so that the ease of shipping, the ease of listing, the ease of everything. And so I, th I think the more of a lens of efficiency you can look with your whole business, you know, because the one thing I will tell you is it's very hard to run two two platforms. But that's the hardest thing I've tried to do is if I start focusing on Amazon, eBay suffers and, and vice versa. And so I never took the opinion that what if I made them mirror each other and make it almost like I'm running one platform because I'll be selling the same type of items because they're like you mentioned earlier, there's some items you can't sell on Amazon. There's some items that will sell eBay or Amazon, but you get more money on one platform than the other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so if I'm out looking for these items, I don't, I don't leave it behind. I'm gated on Amazon. You're not gated on eBay. Let's go. As long as it's not on the Vero list, which generally it's not. And it's, and so I want the, it's just, it's just a different way of looking at everything you do. And, and it's, it's more, I think the one key we keep talking about over and over that I've, I've heard it so many times right now today that it's, it's how do you get that hobbyist, that person only says a little bit to get to a business mindset and how do you get them? And it, cause it starts with the public, you know, you, you'll be at a yard sale, you'll be somewhere and they go, Oh, just list it on eBay. Like that's some simple thing that takes no talent. <laughs> just list it on eBay. You hear that a lot and they're very flippant and, to do it correctly and optimally and efficient, you've got to know what you're doing and it's got to be a business and it's, you've, you've got to have systems. And so that's what I'm using this, the Wednesday show kind of now to talk my way through issues and problems. It's, it's like I have a hundred or 150 people at a time uh, <laughs> giving me advice on, 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 on issues and how to do things, which is pretty interesting. But maybe we're preaching to the choir here a little bit. Maybe, yeah. Uh, a big part of the negative buyer experience is from hobbyist resellers who don't watch these uh, videos, who just, they're on eBay Island. They do what they think is best and it's not, but it works for them. Um, right. Maybe, maybe that's what's happening here. And again, I think that's another reason why eBay really needs to, to find a way to keep people, up to speed with best practices if they're going to sell one item or a hundred items they need to they need to know what ebay expects and I, I i think ebay's dropped the ball when it comes to that yeah and maybe you know maybe that's all coming i mean who knows what ai is going to bring they might have some sort of gate and say hey um you can't list this item because your dog is beside it or you know we the ai noticed that your feet are in the picture or whatever so maybe down the line, I mean, we're all in this for the long haul. Maybe there will be something that comes along. But I think, you know, it's hard because you're talking about, I agree with you, John. We're, we're preaching to the choir. The people that are watching this, they're, business, they're all business people. And the hobbyists are like, I only do it once in a while and I don't really care what happens to eBay. But, you know, it doesn't really matter to me. I just want to sell some junk and that's it. Uh, right. So, you know, certainly I agree that that is out there. But um yeah, I, I just, again, I, I just think it's such a great opportunity. If you do want to build a business, it's a great platform. It gets a lot of shade. A lot of people say eBay is dead, eBay this, eBay that. If you collect anything, anything, you're going to eBay first. You know, you can buy everything. You collect toilet paper from the 60s. You'll find some on eBay. You collect gold coins. You'll find it on eBay. You collect pruning shears from the 1890s you're gonna find it on ebay and i think that is ebay strength because nobody else has that um broad of i don't know a selection of things that are available it's the, it's the so, catalog is a strength it, it's it even to the point where you know this microphone broken i need this screw on this the left side of this microphone you can find that you know you can find parts you can find anything where, you know, where an Amazon is specifically, you know, much more newer stuff. You know, there are some used items on Amazon you can find, but for the most part, and and you can buy like an adapt power adapter or something. But if you need, if your blender just broke and you need just the bottom screw part of the cup and you don't, I mean, that that's on eBay and it's, it is very strong and it's, it's not going anywhere. People think all oh, the death of eBay. I'm like, 
do you realize what it takes to kill a, a business with that much money they have? <laughs> and yeah, it, it's it's just I don't I don't I don't know that it's possible. Well, and, and my concern as a seller though isn't the you know the death of eBay. Like a lot of people we use that for clickbait in their videos and this that and the other thing. But for me, it's strengthening eBay, and I don't want to see eBay. Uh, weakened because they're losing sellers hand over fist. The more sellers on the platform, the more it benefits you and I. And that's my biggest concern. How do we keep these buyers on the platform so that we can keep making money? I mean, there yeah, are, so go ahead, Beard. I was like, there are, I mean, we, we like the, the, the squeaky wheel, you know, the bad seller, the, you know, the ones, those, those get it, but there are some good, you know, like an example, Last Thursday, I ordered brake pads for for my, and I like some of the stuff eBay's doing, brake pads for the van, because the ones I had on it were loud. And so I ordered them from Detroit Axle. Love, love Detroit Axle. I get an email Friday afternoon saying, because they were supposed to be here by Tuesday, hey, your item's arriving early. They're they're very good with keeping you informed of when items are coming. You, know, you got to give eBay some prop. And those things got here Monday. I shipped them, th I ordered them Thursday afternoon, they got them here Monday Monday morning before ten. I mean, this was very good service. There are lots of great sellers on eBay. Yeah, there are really there are, uh, and I think sometimes we get caught up on the bad sellers and we forget that there's a lot of good sellers on the platform. Yes, um, you know, and, and and I lose sight of that sometimes because you know when I go to buy something, I'm like, I don't know if I want to deal with eBay, but I mean, I guess if we use the tools that eBay eBay gives us, we can look and see. Who we're dealing with before we buy from them yeah uh, that's that's certainly uh something that i encourage and i do uh all the time uh yeah. now being the, that we're getting kind of low on time uh we were talking about uh beard and i were talking before about sort of the future of reselling um maybe kind of jump over there to kind of finish the show off and in light of the changes that you i don't know if you've heard of the, cha the changes that mercari is making where they're passing yeah. the seller fees onto the buyer uh, and also uh, some of the, the possible changes that eBay might be making, or at least some of the focus changes. I don't know if you read the article on e-commerce bites talking about the C to C focus, the customer to customer business focus, uh, sales focus, and possibly the, the uh, a renewed focus on non new items like used items. Yeah. So what, what is your thoughts on that? And uh, what do you think about the future of reselling in general? Well, I think Liz Morton and Ina Steiner both correctly have identified and they, they have run their independent news sites on e-commerce. Um, I think they both correctly identified that uh, part of the lifeblood of, of eBay, for example, and I can speak to eBay because that's a platform that I'm on most of, um, is, is that kind of collector's market, the C2C, customer to customer market of you know used, vintage, antique, sports cards, all that other stuff. Uh, so they they want to see a return, and they've been talking about it for some time, of eBay going back to that model because they believe it will benefit eBay. So they're kind of reading the tea leaves to see if that's the direction they're kind of going. Um, and if they start pushing that direction, they believe, and I think they're correct, that it will bring more customers to the platform. I will have to say that I think for online selling in general, the future is bright. I think it's a little bit of a dark time right now because of the things that are going on in the macro economy. But I think there is a ton of opportunity to grow and build your business on some of these online marketplaces. Some of them won't exist in 10 years. eBay will exist. Amazon will exist. But some of them will not exist in 10 years um, because of their debt structure and everything else. And they're kind of grasping at straws, trying to pull more customers out out into their market or grab market share. So I think, I think the opportunity is plentiful. I think the future is very bright for online selling. And I think it's a great time to start a business. They say, it, uh, you know, it's, it's like a tree. When was the best time to plant a tree? 25 years ago. When's the next best time? Now. And I, I feel that way about e-commerce too. Sure, it would have been great to start in the late 90s, early 2000s. The second best time is now. Start your business now and just do it. I think there's so much opportunity. No, I, I think you're 100 percent correct. I think, I think the changes that it will be coming will be, I think the platforms. You know, 
the one thing I touched on last week was I think social media is going to play a, a, a bigger role in, in, in newer platforms and where platforms go. Um, when you, you know, with the rise of a, of a side like whatnot and uh, the live selling on Poshmark and some of the others, and eBay's got to come and it's, I think there's going to be a social media aspect. Even, even Amazon has inspire Amazon inspire where, uh, if you're an influencer, you can go make lists of people or you can do live videos of, of, of promoting products. So I think the social media aspect will continue to grow. But I think the platforms themselves, if, if eBay goes back to, to where they were, and, you know, the flea market of the Internet, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I think people saw that as a negative, but, you know, it was always a it was positive because it really t- lets you know that you can get anything there. And I think that's their strength. But Amazon, I think, is going to push further and further into um, smaller sellers. You know, everybody goes, oh, the Amazon's trying to kill the smaller seller. They're not trying to kill the smaller seller, but they're trying to, in the same way, I'm trying to be more efficient in my business. You know, they're trying to increase the efficiency in theirs. And the efficiency of theirs is 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 being able to tell the customer how much inventory they have and, and being able to have that inventory available all the time. And so yeah. it's much harder for a smaller seller who's selling one-offs and those kind of things, but they don't want that to go away. They, they can't have that go away because that if the smaller seller goes away from Amazon, it reduces their catalog tremendously. I mean, you're talking almost 60% of sales on Amazon are third party sales and we're, we're not yeah. all monster sales. You know, a lot of us are, are smaller sales. So, but we, you know, a lot of stuff that I sell, I'm, there's a bunch of listings. I'm the only one on it. It's not on. It's not on Amazon if I don't sell it. And so they need small. Well, sellers. yes, and also, also there's a paradox here. Uh, and I, I wanted to bring this up earlier, so I'm glad you guys went in this direction. There's uh, eBay wants to bring luxury brands onto the platform, or at least they did. Uh, so they want the Louis Vuitton and the Rolex and all the high end and everything else, Hermes, uh, Richard Mill, all this other stuff. The thing is, what makes a brand uh, luxury is exclusivity. So most people can't afford it and they can't get it. You want to get a Rolex, they're going to put you on a 10-year waiting list. So the brands don't want this stuff available necessarily on eBay, right? So now we see that the brand bureaus and the takedowns and the this and the that. So, you know, there's a bit of a paradox there. I think my own opinion, and I'm, it's not my company, but I think they would be better off focusing on C to C and just not worrying so much about what, you know, Adidas wants or what, you know, some of the, or, you know, the luxury brands, because I don't think they want their products um, necessarily showcased on the platform. I could be wrong. I might regret saying that, but. Um, Do you think the eBay customer is looking for a Rolex or a high end brand on eBay? I I think from their history or where they come from, I don't think that's the first thought. If you go, if you're thinking about, you know, spending the high dollars on a, on a luxury item, eBay's not. I don't even know that Amazon is your first choice right now. No, you know? and and like I'll I'll say Rolex because I'm a, I've had a, a Rolex watch before, and the experience on eBay is you buy it, it, it gets authenticated and shipped to your house. If you go to the Rolex store the authorized dealer, they're measuring your wrist. You're getting a glass of champagne. They're sitting you down. They're giving you, you know, you might have a little lunch. You're like, it is like this crazy, amazing experience where they open the doors and they usher you in and you have this side room. You can't replicate that online. You just simply can't. You can't. And I think they've gone a long way with their authentication services where like, you're going to get a genuine Rolex. And if you open up the backs of the back of it, you're not going to get scrap parts in there but part of it is the experience as well you know it's the same with Hermes if you buy a scarf and it's bunched into a bag and shipped to you it's not the same as going into the Hermes store and having like three people in suits bring you to a back room where you sit down having a glass of champagne and they're bringing you scarves you know and like you said if you're in that market to buy that stuff and you have that kind of money part of it's the experience as well yeah, so I, I think that was a definite mistake on eBay's part to really, really push for something that I don't, I don't know that as we have, they change CEOs and people come in with different ideas or they've got different people in, in the, in the direct, trying to change the direction. Like I, I don't think they knew who their customer was. And I think that, I think that was an issue. And I think 
I think that's being right now. I think that the things that we see come from eBay, they're 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 realizing who their customer is, and you know, so hopefully yeah. the future is 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 bright for sales, just be just because of treating the customer well and not ignoring that customer. Right, and and we just got to consider that people aren't going back to brick and mortar. They've developed uh, habits of buying online, and they're going to find uh, the 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 platform that gives them the best service and meets their needs. And I don't see that changing at all. Uh, and it's up to eBay and these other sites to, to create uh, that, that buying experience. I don't know about the whole Mercari thing on how that's going to sit with buyers uh, putting the fees on them. Uh, yeah. Like yeah. They're, they're copying a, a model off of the auction houses like Christie's and Waddington's and Heritage where they pass all the fees on. Well, not all of them. There is a seller fee as well, but they're passing the fees on to the buyer. Um, I think that works, in my opinion, in high end market where you're buying art or a, an antique that is worth a lot of money. Then you might not care about the buyer fees, but I think for the, the reused market and you, you can see this with our buyers you know, you might put seven ninety nine shipping and they're like, can you lower the price of the shipping? Mm -hmm. You know, they want it down two bucks. That's the that's the majority of the customers on Mercari and eBay and stuff. So getting a shock surprise 20 percent fee or 8 percent fee or whatever, I don't think it's going to be very welcome either. But I don't know. They're, they want a, a, a bigger catalog of items. They want eBay sellers over there. So let's see what happens, I guess. But um, I'm not jumping ship. No, not at all. I, I mean, we, we cross post over to Mercari and all that. And from a seller's perspective, it's kind of cool that we don't have to pay that, uh, what, 10% fee. Uh, it's like the buyer now is 10% uh, that they have to pay plus the 2.9% and then like the, what, the 50 cent transaction fee or something like that. Um, I think I'm on it. I think I'm right there. But uh, do you see any other platforms taking that Stand, that line, maybe adjusting the fees over to the buyer. I think so. For me, the, the a strong one is Poshmark. Um, uh, some of the other platforms that I look at, they're just so saddled with debt and VC funding and LP funding that I don't know in this kind of environment how they're going to grow and, and keep getting more money. Uh, but Poshmark is very well funded. I think it's a Korean company. Um, uh, so they, they can do, you know, and another one is is Timu that's very strong. It's owned by Pin Duo Duo, which is uh, like a retail chain or retail company in in China. So Timu and Poshmark, I think, are probably eBay's biggest competitors. And of course, Amazon and Walmart. Mm -hmm. um, I think those are those are the the big dogs. But um, I don't, you know, I don't know. It's they're they're at war for customers, and the customer base has shrunk. So yeah. Yeah. Well, so what is what's uh, so we can close this out. Want to kind of end it on this note. What is in the future for Josh Galt? What do you have planned here uh, in 2024? Josh Galt is going to get his old physique back. Josh Galt is going to or I'm going to do the best I can to grow my business and, and build my business and maintain the processes and build relationships. Um, but there is a lot of like fanning out work that I have to do getting an accountant um, and working on, as we mentioned earlier, the incorporation, uh, how that's going to work, how that's going to look. I'd like to hire someone. And I also have um, three very big um, auctions, paydays that are, are coming to fruition this year. And I want to make sure that my tax burden is not, you know, just this massive unbearable thing when that finally comes through. So uh, those will be my, my main focuses. What about you guys? What about, what about your what, channel? <laughs> I don't know where that fits in there. I, I mean, I, I enjoy, there are parts of it that I really enjoy. I, there are parts of YouTube that I really don't enjoy. It's a big time commitment. And, um, you know, I, I, I talked about this a little on my own channel, so I won't go too much into it. But there are parts of it I really like. Like, there are a lot of people on YouTube I really want to meet in real life and just go out for a hamburger. And be like, you know, hey, uh, how's it going? You know, I know you from there. And, and just talk to them and hang out with them. And, you know, show me like somewhere around here that's kind of neat and fun. That's that's the kind of part of YouTube that I, I really like. 
Um, so I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know. Maybe in the comment section below, what does everybody think? Should I keep dump? We'll see. Well, I'm sure more people want you to keep it than dump it. But uh, Beard, why don't you take us away? Got any final thoughts? No, I, I think the more you can, just to sum up a lot of this, the more you can, the more you can focus on. We talk about focusing on business, and I, and I think we ignore us. Lots, all, all of us run our own businesses, and so if I'm focused on a business, that's focus on me and what I do, and you know, and my mindset and the. And I've ignored that part. And so this this year is really for me is rebuilding, you know, what I sell, how I sell, how I deliver it. And and I think working on me, I think working more on me. I think Josh is right with the health. Um, I'm the old guy in this group and, you know, I just turned 55. So you, you've got to you've got to maintain your health. You've got to maintain because once you lose you then what happens to your business? So I'm, I'm working on why streamline, why do everything so I can ma do other things outside of the business. You know, how, how do you spend, you know, the quality of life is a big important thing to me. So how do I ensure that I have time for the quality of life with family and friends is be as efficient as possible in the business so that you're maximizing your effort uh, while you're there so that it gives you time to do other, the things that you want to do outside of the business. And so that's, that's what I'm working on this year. And so I'm working on me. Yeah, I agree. And, and uh, the, the, I think the whole idea of uh, for many people reselling is to create freedom. But if you're sitting behind your computer or listing for 12, 16 hours a day, that's not real freedom, is it? Uh, it may be financial freedom if you're doing it well enough, but not quite the freedom I think a lot of people were hoping for when they first signed up for this gig. But with that, uh, Josh, I want to thank you for taking the time to hang out with us today, this week, episode six. I think it was a, a banger. I don't know if we can do that again, but you know, well, it's all screwed up. Nonetheless, thank you guys for being here and watching the, the program. Uh, I'm sure at some point we'll have Josh back on as a guest. Uh, and uh, Beard, uh, I don't know about you, but I think we had a really good episode. Yeah, I'm very, very happy. I, this is a great conversation. And I think that's the strength of what we do. We just, we have a little bit of a topic, but I, it's, it's, it's really the, the conversations because I don't think we spend enough time with other resellers talking serious. You know, I'm looking forward to meeting somebody in April, April 26th to 28th. I'll be in Nashville for the Nashville meetup with the Nashville Flippers. So I uh, hope to see some of you guys who listen to the show there. So with that, guys, uh, we're going to, uh, Call it a, an episode, and thank you guys for watching, and we will see you guys next week. And thanks for being on the show, Josh. We appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, appreciate that, Josh. No problem. Thanks for having me.